Welcome to the RJLT Economics. In this podcast, I want to make two points on the economic and social carnage of hybrid wars. First, I want to argue that unlike it is with conventional wars, the damage of uh, a, a hybrid war is more widespread within the society. Second, I want to argue that unlike it is with conventional wars, the enemies and targets of a hybrid war um, are harder to define, less clear, and therefore uh, there will be more collateral damage. So let's go on to the first point. The first point basically, I think, um, it arises from the fact that hybrid wars involves not only a kinetic element, but also there's an information element, there's an economic element, and of course there's an intelligence element. With regards to the information element, we are seeing today that um, the so-called quote-unquote collective West uh, having control of much of the uh, of publicity sources, right? The, the PR tools, the uh, internet, and the, all the news, pa, uh, new, news um, outlet, it is able to control the information. And sometimes this, these information controls, because there is um, not a single source of truth, right? Because when you are uh, conducting hybrid warfare, information war, you are making up so-called, you are making up uh, things and to make it as fact. That means that uh, unlike truth, which ha is a singularity, a lot of times it isn't, truth can be uh, comple complex, but relatively speaking, truth is almost like a singularity. Whereas when you make up lies, um, when you make things up, it is very difficult to keep uh, things very coherent. And because you have so many different outlets making things up at the same time, and there is not a single um, highly centralized source of coordination, that means that all these fake news can, be, can contradict each other. And uh, the, the long-term impact, I believe, the carnage, in other words, in the society, is trust in the system. And we are already seeing an erosion, a quick erosion, in the trust of a lot of these information systems um, in the West. And I think outside, outside the West, the trust in these systems have all but evaporated. And in some countries, um, namely China, for example, I see that the trust in the uh, Western-led information system, uh, in, oh, how, how to say it, this, uh, you know, this PR machine, uh, the trust is non-existent. There is absolutely no trust. And so in the long run, what this will result in is a loss in the trust in the system. Whenever a politician comes in to tell the public that um, um, that they are fight that this politician is fighting for democracy and freedom, what the public hears uh, is that this politician is fighting for uh, for grift, is fighting for corruption, is fighting for dominance, exploitation, and imperialism. That's basically what uh, uh, the, the, the cost of this. And I think this will have an ex unexpected toll on the uh, credibility, especially of the American empire. Because uh, uh, Amer the Americans rely upon the values that it sells uh, to, to build relationships internationally. When fewer people um, give credence to uh, their words, it basically weakens the system. And then, of course, when it comes to the economic elements of hybrid war, 
we assume that in this case it is the European Union that is that has suffered tremendously and uh, perhaps unexpectedly to some of the uh, uh, the the I wouldn't call them leaders but you know uh, bureaucrats officials of uh, uh, certain European uh, organizations and European countries they thought that they would uh, easily crash the Russian economy. They thought that they would thereby um, institu instigate a regime change in Russia. Uh, they, would they, they would thereafter be able to get in Russia, uh, take its resources, exploit its people, and, uh, uh, and then everything would be just beautiful for them. Of course, they will be able to, uh, these government officials will be able to, you know, use uh, some of the money that's, uh, that, they, that they seize to help, uh, let's say, Ukraine to rebuild. And in the process, they will be able to take cuts, kickbacks, 10% to the big guy, uh, this, this type of re uh, arrangement. And they will be able to uh, live a very happy life. But they fail to realize that when you wage a hybrid war um, with the economic element, this, uh, and in today's interconnected economy, what you are doing is hurting yourself just as much, if not more, than hurting the other party. In fact, the economic war does not work unless there are some economic connections between you and your purported em, uh, enemy, right? And uh, when you cut your economic ties to hurt your purported economic enemy, you're also necessarily hurting your own economy. Now, uh, European Union, in this case, suffers a lot more because the European Union's economy is a basket case because the European economy is not resilient. It is instead reliant on, I think, uh, to, to, to a large extent, the Russian uh, energy and uh, raw materials, but also, I think, on supply chains from Asia, not just from China, but also from Asia, and energy imports also from the Middle East. Uh, that is to say that the, the European economy, far from being self-sufficient and resilient, is reliant and dependent uh, upon uh, people that they despise and want to wage economic war against. That obviously is an unwise situation if you look at it this way, because it is those who are more resilient, more self-reliant, that can weather um, an economic war better. Now let's move on to the kinetic element. This is really quite conventional. This is the, uh, uh, the element that perhaps is the most predictable. And uh, in today's conflict, we're seeing that this is perhaps the only element that the, the, Rus the Russians are really good at, at least for now. Uh, globally, it seems that they are not really good at, uh, not at all, when it, when it comes to uh, the information war element. Uh, they all but gave up. I think they've given up uh, on this information front almost completely. Uh, with regards to the economic element, I think uh, so far they haven't really retaliated, save for the request to... Um, for, for unfriendly nations to purchase uh, raw materials, natural gas, uh, in rubles from Russia. That is like the only small economic retaliation that uh, uh, Russia has launched. And I think more are forthcoming, but Russia is taking it easy on this front, knowing full well, I think wisely so, that an economic war is not something that you can win without hurting yourself. So Russia is being very cautious, especially since it is uh, a smaller economy. It wants to be cautious 
uh, in really being too belligerent on this front. And I think that this is really something that is uh, uh, that we should applaud, right? being being reasonable on this case. Uh, and uh, in this case, and uh, when it comes to the kinetic element, it seems that the Russians are succeeding, but not without um, a lot of difficulties. I think uh, they probably did not expect so tough a resist resistance uh, in in Ukraine, and uh, they might have underestimated the um, the toughness of the Ukrainian soldiers, and uh, they have perhaps I don't know for sure, but perhaps also underestimated the fin fanaticism of. Uh, the radical elements and uh, also the uh, fanaticism of the collective West in offering, mm, I would say, just almost unadulterated support uh, for the uh, for the Ukrainians. So in, uh, in that sense, Russia is facing some difficulties. I still expect them to be able to achieve their end game which I have discussed in one of my previous podcasts released last week. So I encourage you to take a look at that one as well. And uh, this underestimation of uh, the enemy, uh, let's, maybe the, the, the Russians are not considering op openly the Ukrainians as the enemy, quote unquote, but uh, let's say uh, this underestimate, uh, underestimation of uh, the difficulties of the challenges reflects uh, another element, which is a weakness in on the Russian part of uh, intelligence. I listened to a podcast on the on the Duran featuring Scott Reader, and uh, Scott Reader mentioned one element which I also quite agree uh, agree with, uh, which is that the Russians probably uh, got misled by some of the intelligence players, possibly aided by the CIA, um, in believing that uh, the Ukrainians would welcome them. There were not really, a lot of the, the, the standard soldiers would uh, put on their arms very quickly, that they dislike uh, their, their current regime, they do not support their current system, which really all sounds very reasonable, uh, but it has not, uh, reality hasn't played out in that way. So there's got to be some reason behind it. Perhaps in the future we will, and we will see, uh, one of the possibilities is that maybe the, uh, even the, in the standard armies, uh, the standard mil Ukrainian military, perhaps the more conventional, uh, the more um, reasonable commanders have been replaced by those who are more radical, and uh, perhaps there have been a way in screening and selecting the, um, the, um, the conscripts, uh, the military uh, personnel, such that the servicemen are on average more radical than they were eight years ago. This is, this is just me uh, just uh, making, speculating. But the, the, but the thing is, um, on this intelligence front, there's also some unexpected carnage. There will also be unexpected carnage. Because whereas when Russia first came in, I thought, I felt that their posturing was not to really, you know, partition Ukraine. Was they were not thinking of, uh, you know, regime change. I think with this failure on their part in, in the intelligence, they would have realized. They should have realized that um, it is not possible for uh, a for a peace or stability to be maintained if they do not go all the way. And this may basically mean that a prolonged conflict is perhaps 
inevitable. And that also goes back to the carnage on the Ukrainian people. More Ukrainian, more innocent civilians who are living in areas that are currently not in conflict may eventually at some point be dragged into this conflict. And the Europeans, the, I mean, people from uh, living in the European Union, they will have to face even longer period of difficulties, uh, higher inflation, faster decline in, uh, uh, in living standards, all because this war, this conflict is prolonged and this was because of this, uh, this intelligence war. And uh, that's just uh, the, the, the fact with hybrid wars. You don't just lose militarily with some economic destructions, but you lose trust in, in the system, you severely damage your economy, and uh, you lose, uh, basic, uh, basically, uh, you prolong the war. Uh, this, I think, really is not really in the interest of anyone but those who are benefiting from the war. And there are a few of them. So this is the first point I want to make. The second point, uh, just to remind you, the, that I want to make, is that the enemies and targets of a uh, hybrid war is no longer so clear, right? And uh, the main point that I want to make is that nobody, nobody benefits from this war in Europe. But some people are benefiting from this war. And people who are benefiting from this war allegedly are close allies of the Europeans. The Europeans, led by um, useless, bureaucratic, aristocratic and uh, ideological elements who uh, basically uh, want to suck up to those who benefit from this war are going to uh, really suffer, I would say, in the long term, no less than the people of Ukraine. Because these years are a uh, this year, last year, and uh, I would say the next couple of years, are a pivoting point in the world history. I think in the 21st century, this is a pivoting point. This is a pivot point, I'm sorry. And what I mean is that uh, there will be a, a shift in the uh, economic activities. And uh, if everything goes in today's trend, we will see a more, as the, the Russians and the Chinese call it, a fairer uh, world economic system where people, where countries are competing with each other on a more equal footing without a dominant player using their own exorbitant privilege uh, and uh, their presumptuous moral high ground to dictate on the domestic affairs of others. And uh, so um, Europe, which could have been part of this pivot, which actually uh, a lot of so several countries like Portugal and it Italy, I think, used to be part of uh, the uh, quote unquote Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, which is a basically a project to tie the world uh, on the Eurasian continent uh, together economically and to develop more cooperative relationship instead of a co competitive or confronted, uh, confrontational relationship. But the current stance of Europe led by these, I would say basically, you know, uh, no, I don't want to make too, 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 too harsh a, a criticism, but you know, some people would say tre treasonous, uh, but others may say uh, foolish 
and perhaps some others would uh, would say that it's just simply bureaucratic uh, in, in uh, whatever these elements Europe will be will lose this opportunity and with the inevitable fall of the euro as a currency as a, an important hard currency I fail to see any European economy uh, really be that successful in the in the coming decades because we're talking about economies that are highly indebted severely regulated over regulated severely overburdened by regulation let's say overtaxed with uh, a uh, very high uh, very uh, difficult burden when it comes to the social security right uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, what is called uh, um, well uh, what expenditures anyway these governments need, need to spend money on this uh, uh, non-discretionary non non uh, expenditures right uh, these things um, and with a uh, uh, with very little natural resources with high re reliance on um, uh, in the imports of raw materials I think um, it is very difficult for Europe to compete with uh, a lot of uh, its comp competition from a lower cost less regulated economies and I'm not just talking about the Asian ones but even the African ones and um, maybe even the Latin American ones if they can play their cards well I'm not necessarily suggesting that they necessarily will succeed in that but I think uh, in Asia and perhaps in Africa we will, we will see some competition now I'm not suggesting that the European economy will be fully wiped out but with a with a less uh, lowering competitiveness um, the the importance of the European economy will decline and uh, with it the living standards of the Europeans this is tragic for the uh, for the Europeans and uh, to a large extent I would argue that they are no less a victim of uh, and target of this hybrid war now there are now a lot of Europeans so worked up that they want to uh, that they almost want to say that the das Reire, uh, das Reire, uh, division is going to march on Moscow uh, is going to uh, capture uh, capture Stalin and uh, they they are going to uh, whatever right they, they, they are going to put their Wolf's angle on top of the Kremlin and uh, and so on and so forth and that simply is not going to happen this fanaticism that's been uh, instigated by this hybrid warfare on the information front and to some extent by the economic front and intelligence front will permanently damage Europe anyway so this is my take on the economic and social carnage of hybrid wars I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this podcast and if you like it please do uh, give me a thumbs up uh, share subscribe and um, just know that this podcast is also available on Odyssey and Rumble and uh, you can also find me on drjlt.com. Thank you very much and have a great day.